welcome to my speech today at TEDx Embrace Change. My speech today is going to be about using new opportunities responsibly, um, principles for the application of artificial intelligence. My name is Alex Sogario. I've been heavily or intensively exposed to artificial intelligence for the past five years, from building products to actually being the AI lead in a consultancy and now leading a team on strategy and AI products in a large corporation. Um, before I go into the AI principles and why I think they are so crucial, especially at this given point in time, I want to talk a little bit more about how AI has affected our everyday lives. And I want to talk also about the trends that currently are affecting artificial intelligence and how those might, might be very, very relevant and important also for the topic of principles in AI, for a reasonable use of new technologies. So let's start out talking first about how AI has really changed our lives. If you think about it, almost every product, all services are somehow by now, if they're digital, have been affected by artificial intelligence. If you go to a shopping site, then usually there's algorithms that help you find the right products. There's algorithms to give you suggestions based on your past behavior, past purchase behavior, as well as preferences, which products to buy next, or which you might like. Um, if you're at home, you might have a smart device that you can talk to that, you know, does the grocery shopping for you, tells you the weather, sets the alarm and so forth. Um, if you have a, a vehicle that's rather new, then it might have assistance systems like lane keeping assistance, distance control, and maybe even some more advanced features, um, semi-autonomous driving, maybe level one, level two, as we have in Tesla's and some other, other companies as well. So it has really penetrated all products and services. In customer service, for example, we see lots of chats, chatbots and digital assistants um, that one can talk to outside business hours during nighttime and still get things done. Now, of course, this will not only affect products and services, but also corporations to a larger extent from within. I've seen use cases from fraud detection to automatic invoicing to uh, the car, for example, detection of scratches or damages to cars simply based on pictures. If you take that a step further and think of really the fully autonomous or fully uh, automated production plan, there will be lots of little you know, robots talking to each other um, that of course have AI built into the whole process. And I think AI has a tremendous potential for change, for positive change in the world, but we have to be very, very careful about it. If we just jump right into it and just do whatever is possible, we might miss the mark and we might lose the trust of human beings, of our customers and of our fellow co-workers. So we need to be careful with that. And that's what my talk is going to be about today. Um, now let's look a little bit at the trends that we see in AI. One is AI democratization. Um, back in the days, AI used to be something for the nerds. So the nerds would come and say, hey, uh, we're doing statistics and mathematical stuff and working with algorithms. But that was something reserved to really people who have the knowledge to deal with it. With the rise of the cloud and APIs you can easily call from large cloud enterprises and software companies, everybody can actually consume and build upon AI. There is something called AutoML, Auto Machine Learning, where you just take data, have a pre-trained, pre-configured algorithm, you put it in and you get an output. And you don't have to be a professional AI engineer, researcher or data scientist to basically use it. The same goes for lots of APIs when it comes to translation, picture recognition, um, when it comes to speech to text to speech or speech to text, auto transcription, all that sorts of functionalities that help you actually apply AI in your everyday life very easily without having deep knowledge. Also, the ascent of massive uh, open online classes at those large, larger you know, online education platforms have allowed for people to access uh, special knowledge and use it uh, whichever way they want to. Now, um, the further thing that I want to go to is also the accelerating hardware. We used to have lots of data that we collect from various sources that we can use to actually, um, you know, build machine learning models on top of it. However, we lack the computing power. Now we have something that's called uh, GPUs, like graphical processing units, actually coming from the gaming industry, that help us to process that large amounts of data and enable us to actually um, do all sorts of calculations and very, very performant algorithms on that data. Furthermore, we also have something um, next to that, that we have to look at quantum computing and quantum algorithms. They will help us to solve even more complex problems and even larger amounts of data and process them in even a quicker and a shorter period of time. 
Another trend that I want to talk about is Edge AI. So in the past, we've seen lots of um, cloud infrastructure being used for AI. And I think for testing and training, it will still be the go-to place. However, I think that uh, in the future, you will see more and more smart devices. Cell phones by now, a lot of them have already like little um, chips in them that, that enable them to do scoring and of algorithms and that kind of stuff locally. So you, it doesn't have to be trained. Uh, it doesn't have to be executed all in the cloud. And with the ascent of the IoT industry, the Internet of Things, and also the production plant that is more autonomous and running on its own, you're going to see little robots, you know, maybe that check whether a part is uh, damaged, whether enough parts are available, uh, that it has, will have pathfinding. You will have that also in consumer electronics. Be it, for example, your vacuum cleaner that drives on its own and will try to avoid hitting you, your children, your uh, pets, or your table, and uh, will drive have a pathfinding, a little chip in it that will help it to do that locally. And it has lots of, uh, I'd say, advantages. For example, of course, it has uh, an independency of the internet connection. First of all, second, it has a reduction of latency because you don't have to wait for the calculation to happen somewhere else in the cloud. And third, um, there is an increase of data privacy because it's stored locally. That in total, of course, uh, has a shared risk. Uh, it's a shared, it's a, it's a more of a decentralized infrastructure and there is, of course, less risk for data breaches or that sorts of stuff. So I think this is also a huge trend to keep in mind that will affect how we deal with AI. And it's going to penetrate even more uh, areas of our lives. Then one last thing that I want to talk about is the so-called transfer learning. Um, transfer learning is something that, uh, I mean, will be even more relevant in the future. Right now, if we think about AI, we need to spend lots of money to, to try get actually the right amount of data and annotate that data, make that data available for AI. Um, with transfer learning, we will, have, we will be able to reduce the amount of data we need. Think of a picture algorithm that's looking out, for example, for other cars in autonomous driving. So the first layers within a deep learning model, they would train how to identify basic structures like edges and round shapes and whatnot but they won't be able to discern if that's a car or if that's a building or anything like that. Um, further down, you know, in the layers, which are just basically layers of, of, uh, form, um, of mathematical forms and additions, subtractions and multiplications, the com more complex structures come in. <coughs> that could mean that you take the first few layers that are identifying basic structures and reuse those and the data that it has been trained on and just the last layers you specify and for a specific purpose you want it to have for example to identify traffic lights um, so that's going to be transfer learning and that's going to reduce a lot of the time put into training and that has implications also of course for ai principles to a large extent adverse effects that there will be and then finally one of the larger trends that i think and that's something that we see already now kind of like a backlash against uh, big tech and the collection of data is the transparency and privacy trend. More and more consumers or human beings will want to have full transparency and also control of their data. Right now, more and more companies also, for example, in Europe, due to GDPR, our uh, general data um, protection regulation, as well as DSGVO in Germany, it's equivalent, Datenschutzgrundverordnung, it basically um, forces um, companies to make sure that the data belongs to the consumer, to the human being, and it has full transparency over that data and can actually access it, control it, delete it if it doesn't want to have it or anything like that. I think this is super important to have, and I think in the future this will be a competitive advantage. I think Europe did the right thing. At the beginning, I thought this would add additional effort Onto our, onto our whole ecosystem, and it will make it harder to, to, do, to actually have AI companies within Europe. Um, by now, I am very, very convinced, and as was also giving this speech today, that this will be a competitive advantage, as consumers will seek out automatically companies that ensure that their data is protected, and that they know which algorithms are being used and what those algorithms actually do, um, so they can turn it on or off if they don't like it. And I think many other continents, also companies or regions, will follow that same example. And we should do, we should, we should really try to uh, make that even more uh, important and not less. With transparency comes also the, the issue of explainability. Lots of AI algorithms, especially when it comes to deep learning, um, 
and, and neural nets, we don't really know why sometimes an algorithm has decided for A or B, uh, which, which way it went, why it has given a certain recommendation and why it has declined another one. So I think it's, it's very, very crucial that uh, in the future we have more explainability so we can also have more accountability to the system that we employ. Now, we having said all of that, I think that, as said, deep learning and, and uh, neural nets would also grow. I have a little bit of script here that helps me guide through, so you won't be able to see that, but it helps me a little bit to, to go to all the different topics. Um, with having that said, I think I want to cite one of our uh, futurists, Alexander Mankowski, who said the following. I'm going to quote it to you here. Artificial intelligence will only be successful on a long-term basis if we succeed in building up trust between man and machine. And I fully agree with that. If we miss this mark, if we are not able to get the acceptance of society and consumers that AI is safe and it, ha and it acts in the best interest of us human beings and for us, um, we're going to have a huge opposition and we're going to miss the positive change that this technology can bring to our, our everyday lives and to this planet. And since we're talking about embracing change, I think we should be reasonable with those uh, concerns and we should make sure to address those in our own interest and in the interest of our uh, consumers and our fellow human beings. Um, further, also Markovsky said there is a prerequisite to be aware of what AI can and cannot do. There is a lot of hype around AI and a lot of over, I'd say over promise under delivery. So I think it's, it's very, very important that in the future we make sure that we communicate the boundaries of AI and what it can do and what it cannot do. And Ultimately, um, I think we have to put the human being at the center of AI. If we do that, then we will for sure make sure that uh, AI will always do what's best in the interest of us human beings and consumers. Now, having talked a, a little bit about the trends and how they might impact you know, the usage of AI, I want to come to my last talking point, which is uh, my last point on the agenda is the AI principles. And there's four of them, which I think this is the key takeaway take part from this speech today. So one of it is um, the responsible use of AI. Explainability is the second one. Then protection of privacy, the third one. And the fourth one is safety and reliability. I've borrowed those from the corporation that I work for. And I can tell you that those are not just something that we put on a billboard because it's nice. It's something that we truly believe in and that we have to work on each and every AI project we, we, do with, we deal with. So I think it's a very, very cool thing and uh, it will make sure that human beings will remain the pacemaker of technical progress to assert, uh, um, to basically uh, quote here, our, our Integrity and Legal Affairs Board of Management. And I think that's pretty cool. We should adhere to that. And uh, every company should do that. Every company should be a privacy sensitive company, should be an AI principle sensitive company to minimize the adverse effects of that new technology to build trust. So I want to go a little bit more into detail now what I mean by responsible use. When we look at new technology, we sometimes only look at the positive benefits, but we don't look at all effects that it can have on consumers, on co-workers, on society, on the environment and so forth. We have to have a holistic view on it and we have to do a proper risk assessment. And that is what we're going to do here. Um, also, it forces us to have a high quality and representative data set. If you don't have that, there is room for discrimination. And for example, as I said with before at the beginning with one of the trends, auto machine learning. If I don't know what went into the algorithm to build it and pre-train it, or for example, also with the transfer learning, then there might be discrimination already built into it and I'm not aware of it, although I'm acting in the best of interest, but I lack the technological understanding. So there is a little bit uh, of a back and forth between what's convenient and ease of adoption, and at the same time, which makes it more difficult. Now, also, I want to point out that um, another thing that, that I think is very important is that we make sure that we know all the factors that go into the calculation of an algorithm so we can have explainability. That is what I would call responsible use. Then explainability is the next part, which I think is important. Make sure that we can explain why AI has taken certain decisions. And we should have that transparency. If we don't have that, then trust will evaporate, especially if you think about autonomous driving. Why did the car accelerate, brake, turn left, turn right, for example? Um, very, very common. But there's many other things as well where we should know why the AI has decided a certain way. Um, also protection of privacy. Whenever, that's the third principle, whenever possible, we should make sure that, for example, we use artificial data, pseudomized data. 
we don't always need uh, consumer data to train algorithms. Yes, lots of data is mostly a prerequisite to have a proper working algorithm. However, very oftentimes we have made the experience that we don't need real data. We can actually have data for testing purposes, artificial data, and that's doing the job quite well. Of course, you have to run it against again, real data to see to validate it, but still it's possible. And that reduces again the exposure of um, actually penetrating the privacy of consumers. Anyway, we would never use data without having the consent for that specific purpose, which is something that GDPR also states. And I think that's very fair and it's the right thing to do. And finally, um, we have the topic of safety and reliability, which I think is all about having the newest uh, algorithms that are scientifically tested employed and also make sure that uh, we have a culture that's sensitive to these topics. If we do that, have a culture where everybody looks out to avoid any data leaks, to avoid uh, abusing AI, um, to just have any kind of discrimination in it or any other form of, of, of malfunction, then we're going to minimize the risk. It won't be 100% guarantee as nothing is guaranteed in this world, but it will minimize the risk associated with it. And by that, it will create trust. So to repeat those four principles, um, responsible use of AI, explainability, safety and reliability, as well as protection of privacy. I think if you keep those four in mind, whenever you do an AI project, no matter if you're a student, a corporation, an NGO, the government, um, and always make sure that you understand that the data does not belong to you unless it's your machines that produce the data, but it's consumers, it always belongs to the human being. And having that at the forefront and the benefit of everybody, um, then I think we're going to do the right thing. And AI, we can embrace that change that it will bring. It will create new opportunities for everybody and make the planet a better place. All right, that's what I want to conclude my speech today with. And I thank you very much for listening. Um, it's not as engaging uh, by not having a crowd in front of me. I usually used to talk to lots of people and interact with the crowd. So I kind of look only into a camera. I'm looking forward to the panel discussion where you'll be able to ask questions. And I'm also looking forward to hear what your thoughts are on this topic. And uh, I heard that I'm very interesting and co-partner at the panel. So I'm very curious to see, to, to get those two perspectives of my co-panelists and myself, as well as the audience together and see what we can come up with. Thank you very much. Take good care, stay healthy, and maybe next year we'll see each other.